Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are on our fr- last Friday of the month. So we thought we'd bring in a guest that we've had on not once, but twice. And now the third time, uh, he's the writer and editor of Dave Berta uh, website, Substack. I'm not sure if the Substack is actually officially launched yet, but he said it was going to be in July. So hopefully it is in July. So I'm not sounding like a complete idiot by saying that. Uh, Mr. Dave Cornier, Dave, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much for uh, for that having weird back introduction. Back <laughs> no, no, no. It's just fun. This is fun, and you know, it, it's it technically is. I think it's still July, so uh, I haven't launched the sub launch the Substack yet, but uh, it might be July adjacent. Oh yeah. Okay. So, also known as August. So we we always <laughs> like talking to you about Alberta politics because you are the. Uh, sort of the resident expert of Alberta politics on social media and people go to you with all their history questions about Alberta politics and who else would you not want to have a conversation with than the guy who got sued by the sitting form the sitting premier at the time for his URL name uh, Ed Stelmack from the for, now attorney general uh, Tyler Shandro than you so I'm so happy to have you back on the show oh th- <laughs> thanks yeah and, and just, to, just to be clear they threatened to sue me they didn't actually oh they me. threatened I thought yeah, they no, actually did sue you <laughs> no it was it was very typical progressive conservative it was all threats and no follow-through right <laughs> awesome um I, so we are Okay, I just want to preface this before we continue on in here. We are recording this at two o'clock on July 27th. The leadership debate uh, is at five o'clock tonight. So this is airing on Friday. So we are not covering the UCP leadership debate that is happening in Medicine Hat on Wednesday. This has nothing to do with that. So if you're tuning in for that, go watch our live episode, which we're doing later on at seven o'clock on the 27th. So go back in time and watch that. But I want to talk about the field. There are seven candidates, two dropped out, well, technically three dropped out, Mayor Bill Rock, ATB former executive John Horseman, and former progressive conservative associate health minister turned liberal leader, turned UCP leadership candidate, Roz Sherman, dropped out as well or didn't qualify. He put in his money, he put in his uh members or uh, signatures but the party rejected them were you surprised at the dropouts uh, no not really i mean the the party said early on that they basically said rod sherman wasn't allowed to run he asked for an exemption because he didn't have the required member he didn't hadn't purchased a membership six months before the uh before the nomination deadline which was required by the party that your, your listeners will remember at the time they made an exemption for michelle Remper, Remper garner who was, you know, touted as kind of the, one of the big, big game-changing candidates entered this race. They went through the, the process of giving her the exemption um, because she hadn't renewed within the six months. She was a current party member. She had been for, for a little while, but not within the six months. Um, and then she announced she wasn't going to run. So they went through the process of, of giving her the option of running, and she said, no, thanks. Um, with Raj Sherman, he asked for the same exemption, but they denied him the exemption. And I mean, kind of rightfully so. He's not a conservative or just not a, not, not a UCP uh, uh, politico. He's not a UCP person. He wasn't a member before. He's the former leader of the Alberta Liberal Party. Last year, he donated money to the, I think, $4,000 to the Alberta Party. Um, you know, this political parties are private clubs. I mean, they're public in terms of like, they get lots of public attention and people pay attention to them and they're very involved in the public process. But these are clubs and they really get, parties really get to decide who, you know, who goes in these races and who doesn't to a certain extent, what we saw with this UCP leadership race is they really set a high bar, um, you know, with the, with the high, uh, uh, entrance uh, fee, entrance fee, um, the early membership cutoff, which, which was happening, I think August 12th. So that's, you know, it's way before the actual vote. Um, you know, so they're, they're really trying to stop the, 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 five minute Tory trend that had that, that really defined some of the previous uh, progressive conservative leadership races over the past 20 years. Um, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not shocked that, that Raj Sherman wasn't allowed to run. To give him credit, I mean, he raised the money. Um, he went and collected the signatures. I mean, I saw social media, his social media feed. He was going to events for, uh, for other, uh, other candidates with his big truck and, uh, and, you know, parking and getting signatures. And, he did at least one uh, one text blast, um, I, which I received, which I can only imagine came from some former Alberta Liberal Party membership list going back 15 years ago, because I'm not quite sure how Raj Sherman would get my phone number, but that's okay. Um, 
uh, or no, was it robo robocall? It wasn't a text loss. It was a robocall. Um, but yeah, I'm not surprised that they wouldn't let him run. Of course, they weren't going to let him run. But he went through the process, and you know, he, I guess he tried to thought he might they may be able to force their hand on it. But and what about Horseman? Because he was kind of the everyone knows Ross Sherman. Like if you follow yeah. politics for longer than ten minutes, you 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 have heard the name Ross Sherman. But John Horseman was kind of the dark knight in this whole thing. He dark horse, I should say, because he kind of came out of nowhere. No one really knew him. I didn't know him, and I follow politics as closely as I can. And he looked like he was gonna be big because he had the backing of like Brett Wilson was at his campaign launch in Calgary. He had the name people in the Calgary uh, ballroom at the Arts Hotel, but his campaign just didn't take off. Yeah, I mean, he was, he had no name recognition, like outside maybe, I mean, you, you, the, the folks that you mentioned, maybe in corporate Calgary, I mean, he was a banking executive. Um, so maybe in the financial sector, some people know him, but yet politically and outside of that, I don't think he really has any name recognition. And that's a problem. I mean, it seemed that he had no, he didn't have a problem raising the money. Um, when you look at his background, that's not, probably not too surprising um but when it comes down comes to selling memberships and i don't know this for sure but i mean if i were him i'd be you know i'm someone who's of a you know well-to-do background i've been a successful business person or been in executive you know senior executive positions i have a reputation to earn or to, to maintain um but you know conservatives might not know who i am or party members might not know who i am and i might have a hard time selling memberships because i don't have a political organization do i want to risk all that by placing last or or you know placing as, as one of the one of the last candidates. So I don't really know what, uh, you know, that that might have been one of the reasons why he dropped out. And I mean, that's if I were to point to something, it's it's, uh, you know, he probably took a good look at his chances and thought, well, you know, I gave it a go, I got my name out there for at least a month. Uh, and, um, but, but it, you know, he, it wasn't like, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna happen. I don't I mean, I, in, in, in among political circles, I mean, people like you and I and on Twitter, and, but even then, like, I, I don't I still don't know really know who really know who he was. And I, I think it was me and CBC who were the only two media at the event at uh, the Arts Hotel down in Calgary. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, can I get an interview? And he gave me a five minute interview. And I said, how do you get past your name recognition? And he says, I'm going to get out there and get yet again. Not everyone posts everything to social media because that's mm -hmm. not what the culture is in this uh, province. But I didn't see him even like trying to reach out on social media because you saw, saw at least with Sherman doing the posts, Hey, we have 500 memberships. We need 500 more. We need 300 in this location. Horseman is like, Hey, I met the mayor of Amos, Bill Rock. And that was the only social media post I saw. Like it just didn't seem like his social media game. And that doesn't have to do anything with the politics, but it wasn't there. It, it's hard. I mean, politics is politics can be hard and, and, you know, a province wide race, if you don't have either, you know, good name recognition or a good organization or, or, you know, in your own organization or organizers who you can bring in who can, you know, have the skills to, to go out and sell memberships, um, you know, in such a short timeline, that's, that's hard. And I mean, like you said, I don't really know what I don't really know what the, I mean, I don't really know what his what is what his what his pitch was. What was compelling? Or what was compelling about him for for conservatives to go uh, and he's sign up? He's not a so politician. He's not. I mean, you know, and that's in some cases that's a you know that's a that's a bonus. But uh, you know, this is a party leadership race, and it's a it's a pretty uh, and it's a coveted one too because you know whoever wins, at least for the the six or seven months after, uh, will be the premier of Alberta at the very min at the at the minimum. You know, depending on what happens in the next election. Um. I want to preface the next segment before we get go into it is this field of candidates, seven candidates isn't official until the party. I don't, I think it's August 21st or August 29th, if I'm not mistaken, a little bit later in August sets because each there's uh, certain milestones you have to hit of raising 25,000. Mm -hmm. If you haven't already donated your 175,000, which some candidates have, some others are still raising it. So the, the candidates that we are going to talk about are not officially set in stone. They're just past the first hurdle of getting the membership signed up and they've put in their first 25,000 or 50,000. I don't remember how much it was uh, donation or fee entrance fee so i want to talk about the three front runners because i think that's what most people are talking about today and that mm -hmm. is daniel smith former wild rose turned bc mla uh brian jean 
former Wild Rose turned UCP second place winner turned uh, non-politician turned back to politician and Travis Taves, as everyone knows, the former, uh, the, well, yeah, former finance minister. Yeah. Um, looking back when we first chatted about two, three weeks, uh, well, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, did you think these were going to be the three front runners? You know, I, I, I really underestimated Daniel Smith. And I think a lot of people underestimated Daniel Smith. Um, A lot of politicos remember her mostly. The first thing that comes to mind with Daniel Smith is the floor crossing in 2014, the the kind of the treachery of the floor crossing. And I think for a lot of Albertans and a lot of conservatives, um, yeah, they remember that, but they also remember the, you know, the intervening six or seven years where she was the host of a very popular call-in talk radio show. And I think that she's um, gone pretty far in terms of, of, I don't want to say begging forgiveness, but yeah, begging forgiveness from conservatives and partisan, conservative partisans and, and small C conservatives in this province um, for the floor crossing. It obviously, it very obviously didn't go how she had planned because anyone, if she'd known how that was going to go, no one would have done that, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that that she, I mean, it appears that she has redeemed herself. It's a, it's a unexpected and somewhat remarkable political comeback. And I'm not just saying, not going to say that she's going to win this race, but it certainly feels like she's, uh, that she is the she front runner. She packs the rooms. She does. She gets people out and she's, defi- in so many ways, she's defining this leadership race. It's the only thing people are talking about are the, th- are the only thing the other candidates seem to be talking about or getting any traction is the stuff that she's talking about. So she's going out there and, you know, she's saying some pretty sensational stuff and some, some pretty, um, you know, offensive stuff in a lot of ways, uh, but she's getting attention. And I think it was, it was David Kleiman at, at albertapolitics.ca who wrote a piece uh, a few weeks ago talking about how this is really a, it's kind of a Donald Trump approach. And I'm not going to say Daniel Smith is Donald Trump, but, but what he meant by that was, uh, you know, she's going out and she's saying things that cause controversy and uh, separate her from the other candidates and really appeal to kind of the raw, some raw emotions and raw political feelings of of, of, of a political base here in this province. And she's kind of saying, damn the consequence, damn the consequences. You know, the mainstream media can criticize her, the other candidates can criticize her, but she's not going to apologize. And I mean, that's a strategy. It's, I don't think it's good for democracy. And I don't think it's going to be particularly good for the United Conservative Party. Uh, but, uh, but she seems to be getting traction. She's packing rooms. She's, uh, you know, she's the main candidate people are talking about, and it's uh, and and she's she's pretty savvy, and she's well spoken, and uh, and she's saying what a lot of people want to hear. Uh, I, I went to her announcement here in the Northeast Calgary when she was doing her Calgary Stampede tour, and I, I didn't have the chance to talk to any of the uh, con- the attendees because it was I was only going to be there for an hour, and it le- I lasted I think about two hours, and the reaction that people gave her like and these were like former conservatives former wild rose they they were cross party lines because i know some of the former pcs there because i was a former pc and then i was like oh wow this is huge that you're here and he's like yeah she's apologized and i'm okay with that now it's weird that we are seeing Daniel, the like I, I said in the article i wrote is the the phoenix out of the ashes right it's her second coming and she's kind of steamrolling this uh, election without even doing much in some sense, because she's just going to a hall. People are coming to see her and they're hoping to hear what they want to hear. And they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is that what politics is about now? Because we are seeing the similarities between Pierre Polyev and Danielle Smith now of, well, I'll go to an event. I don't need to do the town hall. I don't need to do the mini robocalls. I'm just going to go to an event and people are going to show up. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure her campaign is doing a lot of other stuff as well, but it, but it doesn't feel like a, I mean, it kind of feels like a traditional campaign and that she's having big, big events yeah. and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, and she it, it all comes point. down to, she COVID, hits the points. Yeah. And like, oh, we're not going to lock down anymore. We're yeah. going to destroy Justin Trudeau. We're going to fight for your autonomy, your sovereignty, whatever you want to call it. And people eat it up. I, I, I'm still trying to gauge what, what she has that the other candidates don't, and I can't seem to put my finger on it. 
Well, I think, I mean, I think there's a bit of like a bit of showmanship there. I think she's good. She's a, she's a good speaker. She's able to communicate a message. I mean, you know, she was a politician. She was a professional communicator. She's a, she was a radio host, you know, you know, a radio host uh, and, and was in the media. I mean, she, and this isn't, I mean, this isn't her first rodeo. I mean, she almost became premier in, in 20, 2012 when, when she led the Wild Rose Party against uh, Alison Redford's progressive conservatives. So she has, uh, she has experience doing this and it's been a while, but, but it, but she, you know, but it clearly shows that she's, she's comfortable. Um, but she's this not is without like, her sins though, right? She's oh not, no, no, no. She's not perfect. No, and, no. And, and, she, and, some, I, and some of the stuff she's saying is just, is, is nuts. Like, I mean, I think Don Braid called it quackery. Uh, and I think that's really putting it politely in some cases. And, and I, I try to give benefit of the doubt because we all know my infamous scandal of 2015, my social media post came out and I've been open about that. And I apologize profusely, but you can only apologize enough before it becomes insincere. But earlier this week, I actually think it was this week or even this week, this past weekend, um, she did a live town hall with a naturopath and she said, and I don't have the quote right in front of me, Dave, you might have it right in front of you because you're one of those people that would be able to pull it off the top of your head. But along the lines of uh, stage four cancer patients, uh, they could have done more to stop it from getting to stage four. I don't know the exact quote and Dave's looking it up real time. This is the great thing about live shows. <laughs> they do this real time. And the left went crazy, the right went crazy, and Daniel Smith went, what are you going to do about it? And it didn't seem to affect her because we saw in Lethbridge uh, on the 26th, she drew a crowd. She's picked up two endorsements, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Is, is Daniel Smith the person who is the heir apparent to Jason Kenney? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure there's an heir apparent to Jason Kenney. Um, and, and what she said, does was, Jason I'm, Kenney not have to get off his ass and say, okay, guys, we have to finally say something because Jason Nixon tried to, that didn't go over well. I don't know if it helps if Jason, I don't think it helps. Like, I mean, I, I, I Jason Kenney was so deeply unpopular. Uh, I mean, he said he is so deeply unpopular and you could see it that the impact that it had on his party is that the, you know the day the, the day after he announced he was going to step down, um, you know it, the UCP rebounded in the polls right away. So he was he's the anchor that, that was pulling them down um, yeah, on in the polls before. So I'm not sure Jason Kenney getting involved in this would really help stop Danielle Smith if that's what if that's what you're alluding. I think it would prob probably help her. Um, okay. I, I I think this was a mistake. I, I mean. It, and what she said was, and I'm reading an article that written by Jason Markusoff in CBC, uh, and it was uh, that um, it was a discussion, video discussion with a naturopath about cancer being preventable and quote completely within your control until the until the disease reaches stage four, which is total totally nuts. Like that's just not true. Um, As someone who has, and this was not going to come out, but. Well, we are talking about it. Uh, someone who has moved into that stage, who is now uh, looking at end of life. Um, I can tell you that a politician's comments means squat to me. I understandable it did upset a lot of people. And there are other politicians in Alberta who wanted to use cancer diagnoses for political gains themselves. So I will say this, and I'm going to say this as kindly as possible. If you're yelling at Daniel Smith for using cancer as a political point and saying something stupid like that, then you better look at your own party before you start talking out your ass. So there's my one comment on that. But I do think what she said was stupid. It was not hurtful because I don't think anything's it's words. There's not that much that can hurt you. It was a stupid political move for her to say that. And if she wants to come on the show and talk about how wrong she is, I'd be happy to have her on. I've reached out to her people because they reached out to me before this whole thing came down. And I'm going to say this, come on the show, talk about this because I'm willing to have a conversation with you about um, how I wish, I wish I could do something more to help myself out of this situation, but I can't. So anyway, Dave, yeah. <laughs> Travis Taves, how are you? Um, 
I did not want to cry on the show, but here we are leaving this all in. Why not? Why the fuck not? Pardon my French. But Daniel Smith is one of these people that you just, you take the good with the bad sometimes. And she's a politician that shoots from her hip and she shot from her hip. But we then have the establishment candidate, the one that the Heather Forth cites, the uh, majority of the caucus is in backing, and that's Travis Tapes. Uh, not surprised he's in the front runner status. You? Establishment favorite. Uh, I, I'm not totally, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I mean, this is, you know, it, it's, we, we don't know how membership sales are going. So, you know, he's one of the front runners. Uh, I, I, you know, early on, I would have said he's the front runner. Uh, he's certainly the establishment favorite. He has the most MLAs endorsing him. I think he now has 23 or 22, depending on, on, uh, on what the numbers are like when Pat, because Pat Wren switched his endorsement. Um, you know, he seems to have, uh, you know, the, he seems to be the favorite from what I can tell of, of the Kenny people. Um, is, but is he out there selling memberships? I'm sure he is, uh, but he's not, doesn't seem to be drawing the crowds uh, that, uh, that some of the other candidates are like Daniel. I mean, that, that Daniel Smith is drawing. Um, he had a rally early on. I think it was right after he announced a rally at the River Cree Resort uh, just outside of Edmonton. And all rallies, all political rallies at the River Cree will now be compared to uh, the giant Pierre Polyev event that uh, that was held um, at the River Creek, where there were something like two or three thousand people there, it was massive. And Taves' event was—I wasn't there. I watched the live stream. It was it was well attended. The, you know, there were enough. It looked like there were enough chairs for everyone. Um, but it wasn't a you know, in, in, you know, it wasn't in the giant big room, uh, but it was in a big ballroom. Um, and it you know, people looked like they were polite. But I'm not sure anybody gets. Yeah, it's hard to see people, some people getting excited about Travis Taves. You know, I mean, you could make the argument that he's, you know, probably the most competent of the group of the crew uh, of the front runners. He, uh, you know, he talks like an adult. He, you know, he will appeal to a lot of traditional establishment conservatives. He's an accountant. He's a rancher. Um, you know, he doesn't. Look, he he looks comfortable. He's comfortable riding a horse. Uh, you know. He, that's a big plus for any Alberta politician. I guess, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, I don't really know where his campaign is. It feels like an establishment campaign. Um, you know, I, I, I just looking at some of his some of his announcements, it's there. They seem to be, you know, they're they're responding to stuff that Daniel Smith is talking about or they're responding to issues, but they're still kind of playing it safe. Right. Like the whole the other day he was he announced the Taves campaign announced the, the creation of an associate minister of health care capacity. Well, okay. Like, isn't that the health minister's job? I mean, I understand that. I understand that it, that, that 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 you're you're identifying that as something that's important. But you know, you can't. It's hard. You, you can't tell me that appointing a politician to an associate minister role has ever really fixed anything in government. It's a you're sending a signal, right? It's it's one step up from appointing a task force. But it feel. But it's but it's not really you know, anything, it, I, I, it's hard to see it as anything meaningful. So, you know, they're kind of appointed, making announcements like, like that, like, uh, you know, even the affordability announcement, I mean, stuff like um, uh, uh, getting rid of the graduated driver's licenses, which might make a lot of sense, actually. I don't know. I haven't seen any studies that, that say no it has been wildly successful. On that, though, right? No, no one like, is. And that, and that's it is like, it's, it's just kind of, they're putting stuff out, but no one's really talking about it. Like maybe for you know, half a day on Twitter, but that's about it. No one, you know, if I, if I went and asked someone even who's, you know, moderately paying attention to the UCP leadership race, who, um, you know, what Travis Taves is saying, um, or what he's planning, what he's, what he's announced or what he, what he's planning on doing. I, I'm not sure people could really. I don't think that. people could point him out in a lineup, to be honest. No. Yeah. Like if you put up four Cowboys downtown and one of them was Kevin Costner and one of them was Travis Taves, I guarantee you, they wouldn't know who, which like, they would know who Kevin Costner is, but they wouldn't know who Travis Taves is. And, and that's no disrespect. It's just the Minister of Finance's job is usually never to be seen unless a budget goes uh, is dropped and then they tour and that's about it. And they usually only talk to Chamber of Commerce. So it's hard for him because you would know, but I can't tell you who the Minister of Finance was under Stelmac or Klein because it's just not a position that people remember, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but the other candidate, but, and the other thing I want to talk about is Taves. He is kind of playing the safe game here. You, you talked about that a little bit, but his attacks aren't landing either. 
his mm-hmm. attacks against J- uh, Danielle Smith, because it seems like he tries to come out, but they just fall flat and there's nothing that of substance of the attack. And I know there are people on social media, his supporters and his organizers who are trying to attack, but there doesn't seem to be much that's happening in the, if I'm the front runner and I'm trying to take out the other front runner, I need to start going hard. And they don't seem to be doing that right now. Is that just Mm -hmm. cautious because they're only a week into the past the first deadline of submitting things? It, it, it might be, but uh, I mean, Tave's campaign, Tave's campaign feels like it's being run by consultants is, is really, is, is the kind of the feel, the feel I get, you know, it's a professional campaign, but they're, they're very much playing it safe. And I mean, maybe the, maybe the hope was that Danielle Smith would implode. And, you know, I'm not saying that might not happen because if she continues making comments like, like the ones she made this week, uh, you know, might start rubbing people, hopefully start rubbing people the wrong way if, if she's going to make those types of offensive comments. Um, but, but she might not implode. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's only 12 or 14, when, when this episode airs, 12 or 14 days left for membership sales. So the, the, the candidates who are running against Daniel Smith, I mean, they're the other candidates in the race. Uh, I mean, they really need to, you know, um, up their game, <laughs> up their game, and if you know, if if you're gonna if you're gonna go hard uh, after her, um, then then do it. Um, but you're running out of time to sell memberships, and you know, once August twelfth rolls around, you're going to be relying on uh, on second place votes from other candidates who uh, you know who are who are in the race, and you know that might that might be enough if the, if you know if you look at the math when when the when the memberships are submitted, but um, you know that's. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a that's a gamble right the last uh, last front runner that i want to talk about is brian jean former wild rose leader as well ran against kenny for the leadership of the ucp came second and now trying another kick at the can uh, a poll by main street research which is out of uh, ontario did a poll and it came out about two hours ago where uh brian jean is polling first i don't know if this is polling only conservative members or all of alberta but he is polling within 0.5 percent of uh uh, danielle smith so he's above it's 23.1 to 22.6 for gene um this is a statistical tie let's be honest because the margin of error is 2.9 percent. so let's say they're even um i'm shocked to be honest i thought people like Daniel Smith would see Brian Jean as someone who's just coming back to try to win this again. And if he doesn't win, he'll take his uh, stuffed animal and go play somewhere else. But it seems like people are taking him serious. Are you shocked? I mean, he's got name recognition <laughs> and, he, and he's been, you know, he was part, he was Wild Rose leader before and he, uh, you know, he want, came back in the by-election and it seemed at that point when, you know, when the Fort McMurray Lacklebish by-election was held, it seemed like he was the main opponent to Jason Kenney. I mean, he was the main opponent to Jason Kenney. Um, but, uh, but it seemed, it feels like he's been running kind of a sleepy campaign. I mean, I don't, you don't really hear about Brian Jean much. I mean, he's out there doing stuff. He was talking about gas prices and gouging and trying to kind of um, get some attention on the, on affordability. Uh, and, it, but I, I didn't really see it having much traction um yeah it's uh if you were the brian jean campaign would you be pissed off at danielle smith for running in this campaign oh probably yes absolutely people like if i was brian jean i'd be going i'm i'm the perceived front runner because i came in second people don't like jason kenny they i was out of politics and now i'm gonna come and win this and here's danielle smith say well wait two seconds i'm gonna hold my beer because i'm gonna take this thing and run with full force like there's probably no love loss between the Brian Jean and Daniel Smith campaign, is there? No, no. I mean, Brian Jean saved the Wild Rose Party from Daniel Smith. <laughs> and this is all going back to 2015, 2014, right? But, uh, but you know, when, when Brian Jean won the leadership of the Wild Rose Party, right, be- like, right before the, the, uh, the, uh, the 2015 election, I think he became leader like five minutes before the writ was dropped or something. Um, you know, the Wild Rose Party was des- totally decimated. Most, almost all their caucus had walked over to the PCs or lost nominations or decided, had decided not to run again. And, uh, and he came out of that election with 20 some seats, more than the Wild Rose under Daniel Smith was able to win in 2012. Um, you know, so, so it has to be pretty bittersweet to be in a position 
the position he, where he is now, where, you know, at least she seems, she seems like the front runner. She seems like she's getting all the attention. Um, and, and she seems like she has traction and, uh, you know, it, I just, I don't see, I don't see any energy from the, from the Brian Jean, Jean campaign right now. Now, you know, he, he might Again, be out the, there selling memberships, right? I and mean, the debate he, he was out, tonight could be yeah. a turning point, right? Like, totally. Absolutely. I mean, you know, he played a big role in, you know, traveling the province, he, you know, while he was running as a UCP candidate and just after he was elected as a UCP MLA, he was traveling the province selling memberships to get people to vote against JC Kenney in the leadership review. Um, so he has networks. He has, you know, he, he's been out there selling memberships. You know, how many of those people will come out to vote for Brian Jean? Uh, you know, I mean, they may have they may have agreed with them that uh, that Jason Kenney was, uh, you know, was was a, was not the right choice for party leader, but they may not agree that Brian Jean is the right choice for party leader. Um, but they but some of them might come out. So I'm not I'm not going to underestimate them. This is all this, you know, we we watch what they say on social media. We can see the the events. We can kind of gauge who has momentum and who doesn't, um, you know, and who's defining the narratives. But it comes down to selling memberships. And, uh, you know, it's it's hard to get a, a good. Uh, a good look into that from the outside. Now, on, on DaveBerta.ca, you're a uh, synonymous with uh, running a uh, which politician to watch in tw- the next year. Usually you run it at the end of the year. Um, looking back in December and when you came out with your who to look who to look for at uh, in 2022, uh, th- uh, did you ever think you'd be talking about Daniel Smith, Brian Jean, and <laughs> Travis Taves this much in the end of 2021? <laughs> No, no, especially not Daniel Smith. Um, you know, Brian Jean was, he was, you know, at that point he was running in the by-election. So, you know, he was going to be doing some stuff in 2022. And, and Travis Taves was always kind of the, uh, you know, the, the person that people talked about is if Kenny, you know, if, if Kenny was going to step down, the finance minister is kind of the, the, the person people look to, you know, the second most high profile role, even if it isn't the most high profile politician uh, or doesn't have the great name, doesn't have incredible name recognition, you know, finance minister is, is the senior cabinet role. Yeah. Um, or, you know, or one of the biggest, one of the biggest senior cabinet roles. So, uh, but I, you know, I did, no one could have predicted that, that, uh, that politics would be, you know, as interesting as it is, especially in the middle of the summer, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, but I mean, I, I, politics in, in, in Alberta is rarely boring, even in the summer. I mean, other provinces take the, take the summer off for politics, but Alberta thinks, you know, Sometimes they get even more interesting in the summer. <laughs> I, I want to turn to the next tier of candidates, and that's the yeah. other four, because we we want to make sure we do our due diligence and talk about them. And I want to start with the uh, three ladies in the race that are sort of trying to play pick up here, and that is Leela here, Rebecca Schultz, and uh, Rajon Sani. Rajon Sani, I apologize, I keep on pronouncing her name wrong, even wrong, even though she came on the show and corrected me twice. Um, Let's start with Rebecca. She's got the names behind her. She's got the Rona Ambrose, the Brad Wall, the Tim McMillan of CAP. Um, She has caucus endorsements, I think four as of I last counted. And then she has a few MPs who have uh, publicly supported her as well. What's her, what's her big game here? Like is, I know she's running to win, but what's her path? I can't see her path. Can you? You know, I think that, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the debates, but uh, as much as they might matter or might not, might not matter. Uh, I mean, I see Rebecca Schultz as positioning herself as the, the kind of safe uh, establishment, more moderate. I mean, moderate, you know, when you say moderate, it's, you know, there's a lot of policies being thrown around about, you know, what, but it's hard to tell what's the left and what's the right wing of a, of a conservative party like the UCP, which with a membership that that appears quite unruly sometimes, um, but you know she she seems to be positioning herself as the you know the kind of moderate alternative. Maybe if Travis Taves doesn't work out, or if Travis Taves can't get traction, maybe she's the one who you know takes that. You know she's not a, not not courting the separatists. She's not you know saying crazy stuff. She sounds like an adult. Uh, she has very serious people supporting her. Ron Ambrose, Brad Wall. Uh, some caucus endorsements, some uh, conservative, federal conservatives, um, you know, I think she's, that might be her path to victory is if, you know, if it really looks like Smith is going to win and, you know, there's a push to stop it and it doesn't look like Taves is the right person to do that. Maybe she's the right person. She's a, you know, she's a, 
well-spoken, smart young woman from Calgary. She's urban, which is a, which is a big deal. Um, you know, hard to tell in a, in a political party like the UCP, we saw in, in their leadership, in leadership review that most of the membership was rural. So that's, you know, that's, that's a dynamic, um, but you know, depending on if they're selling and selling, if they're selling enough memberships in Calgary or in in, uh, in the urban areas, I think that's probably her path to victory. And I'm, you know, I'm not a I'm not a strategist, but but looking at the field, that's kind of where I see she is. Can you point to a time in history where a person who moved to moved to the province seven years ago and is a contender to be the next premier ever existed because i tried to go back in my timeline and i looked at the uh, 2012 leadership race with uh, between gary Marr and redford i looked at the one uh, no 2010 wasn't it Two, anyway. 2011 i think or 2010 or 2011 yeah, yeah and then the stell mac i don't remember a time when i can say oh there's an like upstart candidate who moved to this town and now is running to be premier. Like, can you point to a, like, is that not heard of? Not off the top of my head. And yeah, I mean, she's, 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 she's Albertan. Like she's lived, she's been here for seven years. So some, you know, she has an Alberta driver's license and, and, you know, lives, lives in Calgary. Uh, but I mean, she did move here from Saskatchewan seven years ago. And she, it's not just that just, just, just she moved from Saskatchewan. It's just she was, she was a politico in Saskatchewan. She worked as a communications, a spokesperson for the Saskatchewan government. She worked for the Saskatchewan Party Caucus. Uh, and that's where she was able to, you know, how she was able to get the endorsements from Brad Wall, from Tim McMillan, uh, the cap president who was a, was a cabinet minister in Saskatchewan. Uh, and, uh, and who I think Schultz's husband works for as the VP or worked for as a VP communications it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at, at CAP. Um, so, you know, she has the, you know, like she has, a, you know, establishment connections, um, which, you know, could play, could play favorably in her favor. I think she, I think she's one to watch. I mean, you know, whether she can break from the pack or not um, is too soon it's too soon to tell but it, but she's definitely definitely a serious candidate to watch the next one i want to talk about is rajan sani and that is the former minister of transportation and i mm -hmm. think if i'm not mistaken before that minister of children's services which rebecca then got into that role and uh when sani got switched to transportation um she came out with a massive opening she did edmonton airdrie cocker uh, airdrie red deer uh Calgary, she had a big crowd, and then crickets. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, I mean, no respect, a disrespect. She is out touring. I know she is out, but uh, the social media, I know you should never believe what's on social media, but the crowd sizes at these events are not as big as they were in Calgary or even uh, Airdrie. What's happening here? Is is she just trying to break out of the pack, and no one's paying attention to her because the oxygen is being uh, filled up by the Smith Gene Taves uh, crowd? I think that's probably what's ha what's happening right now, and I think that the you know these candidates, these kind of I don't want to. I mean, it's unfair to call them second tier candidates, but but candidates who, who okay, <laughs> second tier candidates, candidates who aren't considered the front runners, right? Who who are, who are in the in play, but they're not uh, they're not clearly in front. They're not getting as much attention. Um, yeah, I think that that it's it seems like it's just hard for her to get to get attention. I mean, she's posting some stuff on social media. It seems like there's smaller crowds. You know, she's having events in Airdrie and St. Albert and 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 uh, and kind of around the province. But you know, she's not drawing the big crowds that uh, that um, that Smith Danielle is. Smith is that Smith is because Smith she seems to be the only one who's 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 actually getting people out on the you know out to out to events. Um, so yeah, it doesn't look like there's it doesn't look like there's very very much excitement. I mean, we'll you know she had a big splash at the beginning, so maybe maybe her organizers are out there selling memberships and doing it quietly. Um, and that's what it comes down to, right? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but this leadership race is a one vote, one member, one member, yeah. one vote, right? It's yeah. not like this convoluted federal point system, and if no. you have a certain amount, you don't get the points. But it's one member, one vote. Yeah, and you have to remember that that you know. It, it was it was a different time i mean it wasn't so much of there wasn't so much social media there wasn't really much social media i mean there was facebook but but that, that was pretty much it at the time but when ed stelmack won the progressive conservative leadership race in 2006 he was not considered to be the front runner and i know there was like a second there was a second ballot and there were votes that were moved around and other candidates endorsed him but but stelmack was out and his people were out selling memberships like hard and they were quietly out selling memberships i mean i think out in in 
in the Fort Saskatchewan Vegreville riding. And I think they sold something like 5,000 memberships or something in, in, in one riding. In Lac Libish, St. Paul, Ray Danilek was out selling memberships. Luke Willette was out selling memberships. Lloyd Snellgrove, kind of these, this, this uh, rural kind of good old boys group. Whereas, uh, you know, who were supporting Stomach, they were out quietly selling memberships while, you know, Jim Dinning and Ted Morton and the other candidates and, you know, Mark Norris was driving around in his Hummer with the Mark Norris wrap around it. And, you know, there was so much money in that race. It was, it was just just obscene in, in some ways how much money was spent on some of these campaigns, especially the smaller campaigns that really didn't do well. But, uh, um, but he was out selling memberships and he really shocked a lot of people when, you know, he did really well on the first ballot and then he did really well on the second ballot and I think it was the third ballot and he, he ended up winning one um, because they were out, sell, out selling memberships and, and pounding the pavement and you know there could be you know there could be some of that going on in this race where you know we're not hearing we're not hearing this splashy stuff from some of the candidates but they are out selling thousands of memberships in you know in, in their particular area of the province where they have you know good connections and are popular and have good name recognition um, uh, you know, like you said, it, it is still not set. We no. do not know who the we are perceiving who the front runner is via social media. And let's be honest, social media is a microcosm of society and should never be trusted. If you want to get involved, you can buy a membership. It's ten dollars. Sorry, our dogs are barking right now. Um, I want to turn to the other, the last female in the race before we turn to the independent. MLA who's running for the UCP and that's Todd Lowen, but Leela here. Um, Leela here has had a tough ride over the last year since uh, publicly coming out against Jason Kenney. And it seems like, and I'm just following what social media, yet again, microcosm of society, she hasn't been getting a, a, a easy ride in this leadership race either, has she? No, and I don't, I, I because she, really ap know. she appeared at the George Chahal liberal event in Calgary Skyview with Justin Trudeau. Uh, I was reading the Western Standard because you're supposed to read everyone. Make <laughs> sure if it's a bit diverse your opinion. Just make sure you're not. They complete. they they get they get stories that some of the other news uh, news exactly. agencies don't. Exactly, but some of their opinionists uh, were saying that she is a leftist uh, liberal hack because she's friends with Jody Gondek. Not my words, everyone. So if you're going to come for me, don't send your tweets to Derek Fildebrandt, not me. Um, but we, Leela has, she's raised the money. She's got the membership. She's in. She's got a tough road to climb. Like I, I said last uh, time you were on the show, she was the dark horse and I would drop her from that title now because I don't know where her path is and I'm trying to read the tea leaves and there's no path to me. I, I don't see a path to victory for Leela here in this race. I, I, don't, I don't. I see I mean, a path I, I, to her nomination. <laughs> well, and, her. And, and, and maybe that's it. I mean, she is facing a strong nomination challenge um, from someone who, who I would say is from the, on the political right of her, to the political right of her in, uh, in Strathmore, Chestermere. Um, but uh, so maybe, maybe this is a bid to, to boost her profile to help her win her, her nomination, uh, which is not a sure thing going into, uh, into the next election. Um, and, you know, she's not a favorite of, uh, of you know, big segments of the political, of the, the UCP establishment. I'm talking about Jason Kenney uh, and, uh, and anyone around him and, you know, anyone further to the right of that. So I don't really know, you know, maybe that's her play. Maybe her play is to try to get it, you know, try to position herself to, to get a cabinet spot in, in the next cabinet and, you know, under the next premier. But um, I don't really know what I don't really know what, what her campaign is about. It's, you know, she's talking about issues like, I mean, she commented after the, uh, after the, the dissolution of over the overturn of Roe v. Wade in the United States, she was the only UCP candidate to talk about that. She was talking about access to safe access or access to safe abortion. Um, but, you know, it, it sounded like she was running for a totally different political party. Like who in the, who did, who did, I mean, yet, yes, there's a segment that that will appeal to in the UCP. Not everyone in the UCP is, is, uh, is is pro-life but uh you know there's the group that isn't is you know pretty small base i would say so it's i you know i don't know who i don't know what 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 she's trying to what she's trying to do maybe it's maybe it is uh is trying to uh to to uh, to secure her nomination or you know maybe she thought with you know she had good intentions when she first ran and she thought she might be able to make make something of it and now it's 
it just doesn't look like it. So, and for editorial note, I said this in the last time Dave was here, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, Sarah Biggs, uh, Leela's campaign manager, is a contributor to the show. She comes on uh, from time to time for a point of order series. Uh, I just want to let you know that we do not talk about these type of things. I do not know what's going on in that rate, uh, that leadership campaign, because there's a Chinese wall between her and I, and that's why I bring people in like Dave to talk about these things, because then I can have an open conversation and uh, allude to what's going on and then actually be completely wrong. Usually how I, it turns out for me. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that's on the record as well. But the last candidate, and this is the big one, because I don't know what's going on here, but Todd Lowen is kind of doing well. And I am shocked at that. Like, don't get me wrong. He is drawing the crowds. Like I saw his crowd in Red Deer, where he potentially, not really, potentially got an endorsement from Cal uh, Red Deer South uh, MLA. He had his event down here in Calgary. did not go, but I saw the pictures and he seemed to bring, bring out the crowd. Is is Todd Lowen the non-establishment version of Travis Taves? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd put it that way. I mean, he's uh, that's you know I'm putting it this way, and then you can correct me, Dave. <laughs> I, I I suspect no, I I I I would suspect that Taves or pardon me, Taves Lowen Lowen pardon, pardon me. They're from they're from neighboring ridings. Um, they're, uh, and they're not the same person, but, um, you know, I think, I, I would think that he's probably appealing to the same type of group that Daniel Smith is appealing to, you know, the anti COVID restrictions, the freedom convoy, I mean, um, Lowen, uh, you know, he actually hopped in his motorhome and drove to Ottawa as part of the, the, the freedom convoy occupation. So, uh, you know, he has the, the credentials that, that, that supporters of that political movement of that, of that, that group would, uh, would that he would appeal to um yeah so i, I mean so maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, did you watch the video that he put out a few days ago i'm assuming you might have might not but he talked about you need to buy membership to vote and all that yeah. and uh, if elected premier he goes on to say if elected premier we will no longer do these written letters strongly worded letters and we'll actually do action yeah and, and i kind of did you see that no i didn't but i i i, I i've seen the kind of i think daniel smith released something similar uh, to that similar yeah so what he did he like he crumpled up a letter that uh, jason kenny read to uh uh wrote to justin trudeau and he threw it in the garbage or whatever and it made me think didn't todd lowen write a letter about how bad jason kenny was and how <laughs> he should be kicked out of like how he should resign like yeah it, the optics there just made me chuckle a little bit because i was like dude you literally wrote a letter attacking your premier and you didn't have the balls to stand up and do something yourself yeah yeah no he, he wrote a letter an open letter um calling on kenny to resign and then he resigned as uh as chair of the UCP caucus. And then like the next day he was kicked out the these caucus voted to kick him out. So yeah, I mean, he wrote a letter. Um, yeah. I, I found it hilarious. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, I, I do think that him and Smith are kind of appealing to the same group. And these are people who aren't necessarily, you know, Albertans who aren't necessarily traditional political party members. Right. I think they're appealing to a, uh, you know, a, a group of people who have made, you know, maybe have, maybe have, have uh, you know found their political moment in in something else other than a political party and over the you know opposing COVID restrictions or you know the freedom convoy or or whatever uh, and uh, and there's a real push to appeal to those groups. Um, I would assume that he's uh, he's competing with Daniel Smith for for similar memberships and probably competing with Brian Jean as well for for kind of that anti Jason Kenny anti COVID restrictions um, group and you know I don't know how. I don't know how big that pool of voters is for, you know, for signing up for UCP, UCP memberships. It's not a small pool of, of people, that's for sure. And they're very motivated and they're very activated. And, and you saw that around the, the UCP leadership review is a lot of those groups were going out and organizing and getting people to vote against Jason Kenney in the, in the review. So I'm going to assume that a lot of those people are going to be still engaged with this campaign. You know, they, they, uh, they helped take down Kenny and now they're going to help choose who his, uh, who his successor is. And, you know, whether that's Daniel Smith or Todd Lowen, um, you know, I don't know. What does it say to you that we have four uh, candidates for leader of the UCP who were former members of the Wild Rose, Ind uh, Wild Rose, I was about to say Wild Rose Independence, but the Wild Rose Party. 
Does that say the Wild Rose Party is a stronger fraction or faction in the UCP than the old Progressive of Conservative Association? Yeah, it would seem so. I mean, I, I would say the evidence suggests the evidence, evidence from what I've seen suggests so. Um, does that bode you know, well for the party going forward, though? Because the only reason they won is the we hate Rachel Notley. And yet again, their words not mm-hmm. mine. We don't like Rachel Notley and we'd rather not uh, have anyone else. So we're going to unify and get this party together and just vote, hold our to- noses and vote for Jason Kenney, even though we don't like him. Um, but now if the PCs leave that that coalition that they have, is it not conceding ground? Like, do the Wild Rose, former Wild Rose MLAs and party leaders have to start winning over some of those old PC members to keep the coalition together? Well, I mean, I guess the question is how many of them were, how, how many of them stayed involved in the UCP? I mean, there are quite a few people who were involved in the Progressive Conservative Party who did stay involved in the, you know, did stay involved in the UCP and are involved in the UCP now and are involved in different campaigns. Um, I mean, I'd say the dynamic is, is quite different than previous than like than it has been has been in the past because you know the UCP regardless of who becomes leader is going to going going to go into a very competitive election with the NDP coming in the next election and I mean when you you look at the polls you look at people who are involved in different campaigns I mean Rachel Notley's NDP have I mean, they seem to be trying to position themselves, especially in Calgary, as kind of the new progressive conservative party. You know, they're they're nominating candidates who are, you know, energy economists, business folks, um, uh, uh, business analysts. Um, you know, these are not traditional, you know, working class New Democratic or NDP. Um, you know, this is not a traditional NDP slate. This is very much a trying to position themselves as a, as a, as a you know, I'd, I'd say the heirs to kind of a, prog- a progressive conservative party is, you know, there's a home for moderate conservatives in the in the NDP. And I think that these, the NDP have been under Rachel Nolley have really been trying to stress that, especially in Calgary. I don't know if they're using the right language that, that it'll work, uh, but it seems that that's what they're doing. She's spending, Notley is spending almost, you know, every spare moment of her time in Calgary over the past year. Uh, and it, and for good reason, because that's where the NDP needs to win in the next election. Uh, they need to win. They need to, to run the board in Calgary in order to win enough seats to uh, to to win the next election. So I guess getting get back to your question about, you know, is this the, you know, is this the Wild Rose Party? Is this the progressive, you know, where's the progressive conservative party? Um, it, it might, I mean, that, I don't even... I, there's so many other dynamics at play right now. Is this a, is this an urban party? Is this a rural party? You know, where, where is the power base? We saw in the leadership review uh, that, you know, the majority the big memberships that have been sold were in, in the, uh, in the rural areas. So it was very much a rural party that voted Jason Kenney out. Uh, is it going to be a rural party that decides who the next UCP leader is? is it, or, or, you know, is it going to be votes from the urban areas or, or, or a mix, right? Um, you know, and that might determine what, you know, I mean, it'll determine who the next leader of the UCP is, but it'll also determine what their coalition looks like going into the next election. If it was, you know, rural Alberta who are rural Alberta conservatives who voted to get rid of Jason Kenney, but, you know, the urban area, conservatives in the urban areas vote to choose someone, you know, very different than, than conservatives in, in the rural areas would like, um, you know, the coalition might look a little different or, you know, who shows up at the polls might look a little different. Who decides to run for re-election might look a little different. I mean, that's the other thing. I track nominations on my, on my, on my website at daybird.ca and, you know, the parties are going through nominated candidates and, you know, the UCP has nominated quite a few incumbents, mostly by acclamation. Uh, but, you know, depending on who wins the party leadership, some of them might decide, yeah, I got my, my, you know, you I got that, my, uh, that could happen. I think it absolutely could happen depending on who, who decides. And it's not, it's not unheard of. Um, you know, if, if, cause some, some of these MLAs were nominated before, uh, you with know, Jason before Kenny the as leader with Jason Kenny as leader before the leadership review, if you're, if you're going to be, you know, if you're in cabinet now, for example, or even if you're a backbencher, but you were, you know, a, a Kenny loyalist, um, and your colleagues know you were a Kenny loyalist, uh, and you support the wrong candidate in this leadership review or in the leadership race, you know, your chances of becoming cabinet minister are, you know, even if you're, you know, if you are ambitious, I mean, I know I've met MLAs, I've worked at the legislature before, every MLA thinks they're cabinet material. What? Not every, not every MLA is cabinet material. Like, you know, some of them just aren't, aren't, aren't cut for it. And that's fine. Not everyone should be in cabinet. Um, so I want, I want to pose a hypothetical to you. And I, I was Sorry, I was going on off on a tangent there. No, and I like that because it was able to make my, ta- my question uh, because I was trying to make sure I did this correctly. 
So I want to I want to put you in a position here because I want you to think about 2014 while I tell you this scenario. Daniel Smith is elected the leader of the UCP. She will have to win a seat in the legislature. Hypothetically, Calgary Law, he would be the choice apparent because Jason Kenney would step down. She would take that seat. So she is elected probably in December. A budget is passed in, let's say, October, or sorry, in about March. What do they have to do? They have to go to the polls. The last time a sitting premier won a by-election and then called an election in March or spring was Jim Prentice with Danielle Smith crossing the floor in December when there would potentially be a by-election. Am I the only one thinking this or am I thinking like this is very like Stranger Things meets like uh, like Twilight Zone here because things are uh, matching up very closely to what happened in 2014 and then 2015 when we saw Rachel Notley become premier. Are the UCP memberships even thinking about this or am I just that one person who's going, wow, the similarities are very eerie right now. The, the, the similarities are there. I don't know if anybody's thinking about that. It seems to be like, I don't think people are thinking that far ahead. Right? Cancer <laughs> brain, cancer brain right there. Cancer brain. I'm putting you off on your game there, Dave. There you go. I, and, and I don't know if Jason Kenney would, I don't know if he'd resign. Like he might decide to keep his seat till the next election. Like that's not a sure thing either. I mean, Danielle Smith, she said she's or she's running for the nomination in Livingstone McLeod right now. Um, you know, she might decide to be premier, to be premier, if she wins, to be premier outside the legislature for the next, uh, you know, the next six or eight months. I mean, that's also a possibility. Um, would give her the ability to crisscross, but I feel really bad for that incumbent MLA in Livingstone McLeod. Yeah, yeah. Knocked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think you'd have much of it. I mean, the, 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 the person running against you is not going to sign your nomination papers um if if that's the case so uh yeah i don't uh anyway that, yeah, uh, yeah. But I, that's, I that, to... that's that's really interesting that's my last question to you is endorsements so this week we seen uh daniel smith pick up two endorsements uh nathan nadoof i always forget how to pronounce his last name newdorf newdorf, newdorf in uh lethbridge east yep. lethbridge west is uh shannon phillips and former Travis Taves uh, endorsee Pat Wren, Lesser Slave Lake, has switched to Allegiance and now is going with Danielle Smith. Um, endorsements, do they matter? Besides, and let's be honest, again, for transparency's sake, I know Pat Wren. I was up in Slave Lake when the, let, the infamous letter came out. Um, I can get, I tell you right now, his sway, unless it's changed over the last two years since I've left, does not mean Jack in that riding. Uh, there is a reason why there's someone else running for that nomination. I'm not sure if Tyler is. I, I, I the, form, the, the current mayor of Slave Lake, if he's going to or not, but there was speculation that he was. I still think he's going to because he was talking about it in the last election. But do endorsements like a Pat Wren matter? <laughs> no, an endorsement like Pat I mean, an endorsement like Pat Wren probably doesn't matter for in terms of selling memberships. I mean, it's probably not going to, you know, I don't think Pat Wren is going to bring 5,000 UCP members with him, but the Pat Wren endorsement and then the Nathan Newdorf endorsement, uh, I mean, it, it, it creates a sense of momentum. And I mean, having a, uh, having a, you know, an MLA unendorse one candidate who they already endorsed and endorse another, uh, you know, on you know if it's just one then it might not make a difference but if there are others coming if you know if there are one or two or three or four or five others who decide to bail on travis taves and endorse daniel smith then yeah it creates it it creates a sense of momentum and so they're shifting towards her they obviously think she's you know she has a chance and they want to you know they want to get a cabinet spot or they want to be in in the you know in the good book of the of the front runner or they're looking at you know in some cases they could be looking at who's selling memberships in their riding and, you know, they may have to face a nomination challenge going in the next election. And if they're in the good books of the person of the candidate who's selling the most memberships, maybe those, maybe they'll hand over their membership, you know, their membership list or their, you know, hand over their supporters list so they can, you know, help them in their nominations. I, I'd say endorsements mostly don't matter. Um, you know, we had going back and I, you know, I talk about the progressive conservative leadership races because those are the, you know, the big ones that you can point to. It's not the same party. And that's the thing that's important. I don't, and part of the issue with talking about the UCP leadership race is I don't really know who the UCP membership base is right now. Like are all those people who voted in the progressive conservative leadership races, are there, are they joining and voting UCP in the, in the UCP leadership race? 
probably not all of them, probably a good chunk of them are Democrats now, but not all of them, right? And then there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of newly engaged people who are, uh, you know, who are, who are getting involved. So, you know, going back to, you know, the past leadership races in the PC party, I mean, Gary Marr had the most endorsements, he didn't win. Jim Denning had the most endorsements, he didn't win. Um, you know, Jim Prentice had the most endorsements, but by then the PC party was so whittled down in such a shell of itself that he just steamrolled over over the other candidates and he was such oh, such, such a narrow and and yeah and i mean you know yeah um you know it, it, that was a foregone conclusion at that point because they were so desperate to, to to find someone who could save their save their bacon um but uh, you know endorsements that come with i mean I talked about stelmac earlier and stelmac had the you know he had endorsements from I don't know, eight or 10 MLAs. And, you know, they weren't the most high profile MLAs. They weren't the, you know, the flashiest, they weren't urban, um, but, uh, you know, they were going out and they were selling memberships and they were pounding the pavement and hitting the doors and going to church groups and going to egg societies and going to meetings and actually selling memberships. And if you can get endorsements from MLAs who do that, and I don't think most MLAs do that really, like at, at in that kind of level, um, you know, then you can, you know, then that's when it makes a real difference. I, I was looking at the, I'm such a nerd. I was looking at the 1992 progressive conservative leadership race and some of the comments, some of the analysis and commentary that was going on during that race and afterward. And, you know, for Ralph Klein, um, you know, it wasn't Calgary that put that, that really saved him in that, in that leadership race. It was really the rural power brokers that really, really, really made the difference for Ralph Klein in that race. It was Ken Kowalski. It was Peter Trinchy. It was the Don Sparrows, the Ernie Isleys who were, you know, from Barhead, from Bonneville, from, uh, you know, white court who were going out and, and selling big memberships um, because they didn't want an urbanite, you know, a liberal urbanite like Nancy Bikowski, who actually ended up becoming the leader of the Liberal Party a few years later, uh, you know, to win, to win, uh, win the leadership. So, you know, if you can get people like that who are, you know, MLAs like that who can actually go out and sell the memberships, I think that's where the endorsements really matter. But I don't think most MLAs do that. And I, I you know, I, or come with those types of organizations. Um, so yeah, so it just depends. N not all MLAs are not the quality of endorsement is, isn't always the same. So I lost your I lost your audio, Chris. I, for, I, I coughed again. Sorry. Um, I, I want to say this. Um, I asked Travis Taves at his leadership announcement here in Calgary um, whether he would let Pat Wren run again because Jason <laughs> Kenny so famously said he is no longer, he, he will not be allowed. And then he invited him back into caucus. Uh, Travis Davis gives us the answer, non-answer, which is, oh, we're looking at the leadership race right now. We don't counter ch chickens before a like, cart, whatever, so on and so forth. Now, if Danielle Smith does come on and accepts my offer to come on the show and talk, I will be asking her that as well, because there, I know there are a lot of people up in Lester Slave Lake, and I, I, again, it might have changed, who are not happy with Pat Wren and maybe an endorsement like that could backfire, but that's just here nor there. Well, <laughs> so an hour later, I think we have finally encapsulated everything. We are far from what uh, over from this UCP leadership race. Um, there will be a leadership race, a debate. There was a debate on Wednesday, which we are recording this on. So in about an hour's time after we're done recording this, there'll be a debate. I'll be watching it. We'll be going live after that. But Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure as always to have you on the show. Absolutely. It's been, uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you today, Chris. I always love coming on the Cross Border Interviews podcast. It's, it's a lot of fun. And, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I'm really... Uh, um, that, don't I'm, do it, man. No, no, no. Don't I'm sending, I'm, I'm, I'm sending you, you know, positive thoughts and 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 uh, and thinking about you and uh, and I didn't mean to uh, to uh, put you in a position where you had to open oh. and bear your, bear your soul on the podcast, but uh, not but, everything um, else on this podcast. So why not bear my soul? Anyway, we'll be, we we'll, you know, I'm sure my, myself and uh, and I'm sure a lot of listeners are are, are uh, thinking about you and sending you positive thoughts. And well, uh, you know, you. we always looking forward, looking forward to. Uh, there are many people who do daily podcasts uh, in uh, in you know good while, daily podcasts in while, this province. While so going, we, while doing uh, cancer treatments, while yeah. going through radiation, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, but Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And to my listeners. 
Uh, we are off all next week, so do not tune in from the first because it's the long weekend to the fifth. But on the eighth, the eighth of August, we are back with a very special episode. We just recorded it uh, earlier this week, and that is with the ambassador to Israel for Canada, Dr. Ronan Hoffman, is going to be on the show. We're going to be talking about the Israeli Canada relationship. We're going to be talking about anti Semitic hate the rise of it and yes for some strange reason we do talk about jason kenny for a good 15 minutes as well so please tune in on monday august 8th you will not want to miss that great interview it will be on youtube spotify and all the streaming platforms with that i want to thank everyone for tuning in for the cross border interviews with chris brown dave thank you so much have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone just keep talking get out from behind social media and go have a conversation with somebody talk to you later